close to that that you can pick up and then pass this clipboard around for people to sign up for next Sunday school class. So I think in a couple or three weeks, uh, I will probably plan, I'll be here next week, I'll plan to uh, finish chapter 22 next week, Lord willing. I think that completes the book and then uh, whoever's taken over from there. But uh, this is for the next one called Images of the Spirit. So if you want to pass that around and uh, go from there, all right? So in our time this morning, we're on chapter 21, uh, these inward trials, these inward trials. And let's, uh, let's get started with, let's see if we can get a little more input from you guys this week. Um, can someone get us started with what you learned, what the chapter is about? What is this, uh, what's this chapter dealing with? Can you boil it down to a sentence or two? <laughs> I'm looking for something a little more specific than uh, it's about some kind of trials. A right, so, so. little more than that. Yes, in the back. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 That's pretty good. Pretty good summary. All right. Anyone want to refine that or add your two or three cents to it? Talk more about. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. There certainly are uh, applications of grace in all these things. Anyone else on that? Kind of a summary statement, purpose statement of this chapter. What's it cover? This isn't a summary statement, but I underlined long-standing problems of temperament of personal relationships of felt wants of nagging, nagging temptations are still there. Sometimes indeed intensified. And I think it's important to know that it's not all smooth sailing. Right. Once we are saved and once we are committed to God. Okay. Uh, it's Jane. Is it Jane? Okay. All right. So, Jane, if you didn't hear, uh, Jane said uh, there's a quote she read of uh, long standing temperament issues and et cetera. And other issues that you brought in from before you're saved. You get saved, and, and uh, it would be a misunderstanding to think they're automatically gone. In fact, sometimes they get more difficult. All right. Um, let, me, let, let me throw out there's a, the, the leader guide has some questions I thought were, were pretty valuable this time. Um, and so let me throw a couple out. You've, you've given a good start on this, that you've covered the, the gist of the chapter. Um, one of the things that, that is discussing is certain kinds of gospel or evangelical ministries that would make these trials worse uh, be, for different reasons. That's what we're kind of working on. Here's the question. In this chapter, uh, Packer is criticizing a certain type of evangelical ministry. All right, we, and in the morning message, uh, if you were awake and listening and so on, then you heard us talk about the word evangelical, which just means gospel preaching or, or believing in the gospel, the good news of Christ the Savior. And certain types of evangelical ministers, in other words, they do preach the gospel, they hold to the gospel. Um, he calls it cruel. Certain of them are, uh, why is this ministry cruel? What makes it an evangelical ministry and what is wrong with it? So let's work on that question for a minute. Um, he, he describes, he's criticizing a certain type of evangelical ministry. Why is this kind of ministry cruel? What makes it an evangelical ministry? And what is wrong with it? So somebody start us on that discussion. Um, and you can grab any, it's kind of a three-part question, but you can grab any or all of that and, and begin the discussion.
All right, well, let's start. I'll, I'll, help, I'll try and get you started here. It's, uh, one of the questions was, what makes this an evangelical ministry? Again, again some of this was in the morning message, but you can, uh, you can expand on it here a little bit. What makes a religious ministry an evangelical ministry? It's from the gospel. All right, the, the Greek word is euangelion. We would probably pronounce it evangel or evangelistic, but that's where we get the word. It means gospel ministry. All right, it, it preaches the gospel. It holds to the gospel. So Packer is addressing actual church ministries that are uh, similar to us in at least that they preach the saving message of Christ. All right, I mean, there are different denominations with. Uh, other doctrines, but it's at least evangelical. It preaches uh, God saves through Christ. All right. So, what would make uh, what would make this ministry? And that's in the first page or two. He's um, oh, he's uh, the very first sentence. A certain type of ministry of the gospel is cruel, and he goes on and says they don't mean to be. They have good motives. Uh, the effect second paragraph is twofold. They depict the work of grace. Uh, as less than it really is. Second, they leave people with a gospel that is not big enough to cover the inadequate resources um, uh, of their need, the whole area of their need. What kind of ministry is this? This is the third paragraph. The first thing to, to be said is it is an evangelical ministry. And he describes uh, three or four things. Are they accept the Bible as the Word of God. Uh, they preach uh, faith in the cross, the new birth through the Spirit, and... Um, and uh, uh, life lived for God is what God intends, that kind of thing. Um, and he's going to get to what makes it cruel on the next page. Next page, paragraph starts with, but if it is a doctrinally sound evangelical ministry, where can it go wrong? And it is going to be in misapplying, that's his, uh, or, or rather inaccurate application of the gospel truths. All right, so let's, let's that's what... The next section, I think, is the heart of this lesson. Misapplied, uh, misapplied doctrines, misapplied application. What is he going to suggest uh, is going on here? How, is it, how, how can a, a church that actually believes the Bible and actually loves people and, and preaches the gospel message at some level, how, how and in what way are they cruel? How are they getting um, misapplication here? I think somebody kind of was was touching on it earlier. Well, it says the preacher glamorizes the Christian life to allure people. All right. All right, Jane, Jane's quoting again. The, the, the preacher glamorizes the presentation of the gospel uh, to, to attract people, to allure people. All right. Let's talk about that for a minute. All right, let's talk about that for a minute. That is very much at the heart of being a gospel preaching ministry, but it's the question of how do we present the gospel? In other words, what are the, what are the points and so on? And how in the sense of uh, attitude, uh, what's the approach, all right? And the statement that's in there that Jane just read for us is some churches, some preachers tend to glamorize the gospel presentation. What what do you think that means? There are examples in the book. All, 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 all the exactly. I think this is in our day and age. This is the prosperity gospel or the health wealth gospel. All right. And I I'm not necessarily looking here to name names, but <laughs> there are people. Um, that a lot of them seem to be on TV um, that do that. That that present the gospel. Um, and the, and the far end of it, he doesn't use the term health, wealth, or prosperity, but I, that was what I was thinking of. That's, that, will be one of the, um, that will be one of the kids or grandkids of thinking along this line. Well, I think that, that's a great example. Uh, and it's, um, sometimes it's easy to point outward because we don't engage in that. But it can slip into, uh, it can slip into our mindset. For instance, when I was in uh, Sunday school, we sang a song that said, I'm in right, upright, upright, downright, happy all the time. Okay, yeah. Right? Which, uh, you know, it was catchy and it was whatever, but it's, it, it's false. Yeah. Uh, we talked, we had a bit of a conversation last night uh, about uh, the, the generation of, of my children and your 
their children, you know, their generation has a hard time sometimes uh, with the church. And um, I think some of that comes from the very uh, well-meaning uh, desire to present, you know, the gospel in, in the best light, like, like we can dress it up. Uh-huh. Uh, but we also, some of that, I know, I've seen in me that, that my desire to present myself in the best light uh, kind of enters into that too. Um, whereas I'm told, uh, and, and working with that generation somewhat, I, I believe that uh, there's a desire for authenticity. Mm-hmm. Um, they like that word. They do. It's a, it's a good word. And, and more than just the word, they, they like um, they like the substance. Right. So, um, and trials are like it's the perfect opportunity to be authentic, right? Mm-hmm. To share our trials. But often, uh, you know, our trials have an element of, well, I was doing something wrong, or I, you know, I fell into this wrong teaching, or whatever. Like, we get too concerned. We can get too concerned about how how we come out in the story. But the story is really about God's grace, mm-hmm. God's goodness. Yeah. And none of us, none of us are. Okay. All right. All right. Other examples or other uh, additions to that. So we're we're discussing uh, the the cruelness of the ministry in uh, uh, I, I guess over promising what the gospel does. And John ha- has said uh, the health wealth uh, gospel, health wealth uh, church, or sometimes called the prosperity gospel. If you're fam- sounds like you guys are familiar with that term. There's two uh, XM satellite radio channels 24 hours a day of, of, of that. Okay. They, yep. They, you know, yep. Uh, uh, so if we if we if we call that you know here's here's uh, the health wealth prosperity kind of thing you know the, these are the the far out ones are the ones that are on uh, late night TV or whatever <laughs> in which they encourage you to uh, send in your uh, your money to uh, start the blessings flowing for you that kind of stuff. But let's let's back up a little closer to home. That that is not typically uh, the the prosperity gospel is not typically in our churches. So I, you know I've, uh, I know you guys fellowship with like uh, Pastor Rofe and uh, Pastor Mowers and so on. Churches th- those are like minded churches. They're not gonna they're not preaching the prosperity gospel. All right. But how about closer to where we are? are th- is there an example of a pre- gospel presentation? That might uh, fit into this general category, not as extreme. And I'm doing what one of my professors did. I'm asking a very general question, looking for a very specific answer. <laughs> very hard for you to do that. It involves mind reading. Um, so again, let me help it along. So you're you're working on being a witness. You have a relationship with a friend, a coworker, whoever it might be. And uh, the the life setting not only is not save, which is what we're we want to present the gospel about, but they're, and you fill in the blank, they're having marriage trouble, they're having financial trouble, um, they're, they're having trouble at work, they're having, you know, the trials of life kind of thing. When we present the gospel, have you ever heard of this or encountered this? this I think this is the, the softer edge of the prosperity gospel. Uh, so, you know, your friend's having marriage trouble, and you say, well, you need Christ, which is true. But you either leave the implication or you state it outright. If you get saved, your marriage will be, it'll be great. It'll be the best it's ever been. Do you, you see the problem? Do you see the problem? That is, not, that is not directly what the gospel deals with. It deals with it indirectly, but not directly. What does the gospel deal with Directly. Their eternal destiny. I, I couldn't hear you. Salvation. salvation. Salvation from the penalty of sin. Salvation from the, from the penalty of sin. Now that we know the marriage trouble and financial trouble and all these things, and the same things that we struggle with are the result of we're sinners, even if we're saved sinners, and we live in a fallen world that's fallen up in sin. But the, the gospel presentation, the, 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 the narrow focus of trusting Christ for salvation is not to save them from a bad marriage 
or financial distress or losing their job or whatever it is, you fill in the blank. We are, we are dealing with the things we looked at in, the, in Ephesians 2, we're dealing with what we looked at in 1 Corinthians 15 and many others, the, the, the passages. So 1 Corinthians 15 again, very boiled down, Christ died, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, I, I, I delivered unto you, first of all, what I received, how that Christ died for our sins. Thank you. I think I heard somebody say it. For our sins. All right. That is the center of the gospel, that we're, we're dealing with spiritual needs. Now, down the road, and this actually becomes more of a discipleship, maybe counseling issue, but more of a discipleship growth issue, is the fact that God actually does have uh, principles, answers, practices, and so on, power to live for him. And it does aid us to be blessed and to be enjoying life under his direction in our marriages, in our finances, in our jobs, in our relationships, etc. Uh, and so it's, it's, it becomes the application. But that is the fruit or the follow-through of the gospel not message, not the gospel itself. And I think what Packer's laying out is the extreme end is the, the health, wealth, prosperity, the a little bit tighter. And this is where we need to be careful um, in the presentation is not promising, hey, if you get saved, if you, know, if you turn your life over to God kind of thing, everything will be great. Now, he, and he actually does cover that, doesn't he? he? It's in the chapter that that is partly what they do. If you, if you uh, get saved and you turn your life over to God, bed of roses, uh, I don't know if there's a local phrase that just means everything's great, you know, no, no problems, um, all the roads are smooth. That is not how it works. And I would say in our circles, in our circles to some degree, here and there, there's at least an implication of that. And that's why we want to be careful. We don't want to swing the pendulum all the way over and say, guess what? If you get saved, everything you know, is going to go wrong. That, that would be incorrect also. Uh, what it is, is we still live in a fallen world, but we, are now, we now have available... Uh, the spiritual resources, the Spirit of God, new life in Christ, the Word of God. We now have resources to face life uh, with God's strength. But, so we, we, we're trying to avoid either pendulum, and he mentions both of those. Mark, I saw your hand. Exactly. Yep. Look what they've done to me. Mm -hmm. Why would you think they'd do less to you? Um, so right. But I, I would also be careful about, you know, hey, I'm a Christian and my life is terrible. Everybody hates me. You know, come join me. You know, we can all get beat up together. That, that isn't the issue either. Um, it, it, is, it is, again, this is where we use the text of Scripture. Um, we, we do our best to present the, the real issue of the human heart is they're sinners. Uh, they need a savior to, Ephesians 2, raise them spiritually, quicken them, make them alive with Christ, and so on. They need to be born again. And from there, we now begin trying to live life in the right way. We, we now, in the power of God, we begin to uh, work towards, with God's help, uh, walking in the works that God's prepared for us, Ephesians 2.10. And so there, there's, a, there's a forward progress here. Yes, sir? Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, I, I think you're on the, the right track. Uh, your wife said in, um, in that you're not alone. We now have God with us. And so the, the whole point of this is not that Christians um, lead um, charmed lives where nothing's wrong. We face essentially uh, the same troubles in this fallen world. You know, Christians get cancer. Christians lose their jobs. Christians die. Uh, Christians... I mean, throw in their Christians, stumble and fall into sin. You know, I mean, that adds some trouble too. Uh, all those kind of things. We, we have the same trouble, but we have God with us. We have the resources. And the growth factor is there is a path that can lead towards victory and facing those, um, facing those difficulties. Is it Peter that describes it with inexpressible joy? Uh, the, even in the midst of trials, um, there can be an inexplicable joy. And somebody, I, I forget who said it, but uh, that, that in trials we can have a great witness, something to that effect. Somebody said that a minute ago. I actually think not only can we say a great witness, but we can actually show a great witness. So it's not, it, it's not that, okay, we're a Christian. I've, since I got saved you know, 45 years ago, nothing's ever gone wrong in my life. That's, that's not true. But if you're a believer and you're now facing, hey, my wife has cancer, and instead of, you know, I mean, there is, it's that, 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 and some of you have faced that. It's a grief process. It's pressured. Um, we've had in our family some uh, chronic illness things with, with, uh, with our kids. And so we have faced some long-term issues with that. But how to work through it with the Lord and then to be able to present to people in the midst of this real problem that we're heartbroken about, that is difficult, we can not only tell you, but we're trying to show you for God's glory how you can face it. Uh, and, and in some of it, we're not, we don't have all the answers. Any of you have had that chronic illness or you know, spouse with cancer or anything, uh, some of the frustration is, you know, as a dad, I want to, you know, most problems for dads, we want to go in and we want to fix something or, or break it if it's harming our kids. And you can't. You can't get a hold of it. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, yeah. But then after I was saved, something would happen. I'm like, okay, what do you have in store for me so I can get through this? And I know mm -hmm. you're going to be there. Yeah. You know, whatever it might be, like the hot water hose from the washer break in, yep. you know, and filling my basement with water. So yep, okay, yep. What do you have in store for me on this situation? Yes, that's a pretty good attitude. I, by the way, we, we, uh, Christians do ask why. We actually have that in Scripture. Um, and the interesting one, you know, one of the, one of the bigger books <laughs> asks that question a lot. The, that book, uh, In the Midst of Trouble, that book is the book of Job. And he asks why quite a bit. And he says, you know, I want to, he says, God, I'm righteous before God. And I think he was. I think he had a right standing, a right practice in life. And he said, I'm going to talk to God. If I could talk to him, I'd get this fixed. <laughs> And if you remember that, that part of it didn't end well. <laughs> it didn't end real great. He did encounter God. And uh, if you remember that, his answer after he saw God and God spoke to him was not, hey, listen, God, you, you know I'm in the right here. It was around chapter 40. You remember Job's response? I've now seen God and uh, encountered him, and I repent in dust and ashes. And Job was, a, was not only a saved man, but he was a right living man. Uh, and that's what, that was his encounter. And the funny thing about the book of Job is, I, I think he asked why, or at least wondered it. If you, if you read through it carefully, you realize that it appears, if I'm reading it correctly, it appears Job was never told why. Now there's something in the, in the early chapters, we know why. The, the why of this one was, uh, this was a cosmic dispute between God and Satan. And Satan said, uh, more or less, you're such a cheap God, uh, you have to buy people to worship you. And God said, no, look at Job. And, and, that, and that's when we get the, the, the accusations and the, the problems and the death of the children and so on. My read on is Job was never told that. I, I don't think he knew. He, he's the stuck, I'm living for God. I even offer sacrifices for my kids in case they're, they're sinned. And here I am with boils, a wife who's nagging me, and uh, a friends who accuse me. You know, I mean, tough spot. 
And he never finds out. At the end, he says, I repent in dust and ashes, and then God restores him. We know the big picture because we can read in the book. That's the way I read, read Job. But there's a lot of those, those, quite a few of the Psalms have that question of why. Sometimes God reveals it. But not always. Not, not all the time. Why did I lose a child? Why did, you know, why did my parents die so soon? Whatever it is. We don't always know why. What, what other things have you learned? What other things you, have you seen in, in the chapter here? Yeah, on the, I think on the right track. This is good, good discussion. Yeah. I like what you said on 250. Yeah. He the last line there. He is he is working in such a way to make us cling to him. We're, we are not adequate in ourselves. We need God, not just in the born again salvation, but in living living for him. We need God, and and God is in all the stories. You know, one of the stories that comes to mind off of that is you you remember the story with uh, Joseph uh, in he went sold into slavery. Brothers, uh, they didn't get along real good. And he ends up in Egypt, and there he, he remembered the story. He worked his way up to being a, a manager, whatever, very responsible. And then he gets falsely accused by uh, the, uh, the, I forgot the guy's name now, but the Potiphar. Potiphar's uh, wife uh, falsely accuses him. He gets chucked into jail, you know. And then it says uh, two full years were there. And he works his way up, and, he, and, that's, and he, that's when he interpreted the dreams, and he's like, hey, when you go tell, tell Pharaoh about it, uh, let, let him know I'm here and I'll get out. <laughs> the guy forgot about him until a while later, quite a while later. And the whole thing at the end, where I was getting to is this. You remember the phrase. This is an amazing one. When he encounters his brothers, his statement is, what you did, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Somehow, our God is so amazing he is omniscient. He has a, a providential plan that he can, he can take our mistakes, even our sins. He can take other people's mistakes and sins because we interact with each other. We affect each other. And he can take the, the things of life and mold us, work in us to make us like Christ. You understand that's the central purpose. That's the central thing God is working at. This is Romans 8. You know, that he is at work in us to make us, to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And I've used the phrasing, I don't even know if this is original to me, but out of that passage, God, that is his desire, that is his plan so much. God is willing to move heaven and earth. He will move circumstances everywhere in order to get to our hearts. And in fact, he is much more concerned with you and your heart, your dependence on him, than he is about your external circumstances, which he does care about. But he cares more about your heart. He wants your heart. And so there's some neat things here. Quite a few pass passages that uh, align with this, this struggle. And uh, the, the presentation, back to the critique of uh, evangelical ministry that would present this poorly. Uh, you know, hey, if you get saved, everything's good, or it's all great, or you know, just on and on with the victories and so on. Um, you know, in, in the face of that would be like Romans chapter 7. Remember Romans chapter 7. Can, someone, can anyone summarize what Romans 7 tells us? If I get you started. <laughs> Paul there in, in, in the, one of the big sections of Romans 7 says, uh, all the things that I really want to do, those are the exact things that I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, guess what? That's what I do. That is Paul. Again, there is a theological debate. I'm of the, uh, I'm of the school. That was Paul after salvation. He, he had inward trials. I think it's Romans 7. Um, some of this sounds like, uh, again, just touching on passages, uh, the, the parable of the sower and the seed. Um, if you remember, it's in the three synoptic gospels. Um, the, the one seed fell on the, uh, the stony ground, and it sprang up quickly, 
and then the, the, the interpretation, that the, the story and the interpretation go together. It says, because of the trials of life and the, the deceitfulness of, you know what was deceitful? What is it? The heart. The heart. Uh, there's, one, there's a different one in the text there. The deceitfulness of riches. I think there's one other one I'm missing. But the pressures of life, because of those things, they didn't have deep roots. And they fell away. That sounds kind of like what's going on here. Hey, hey, come and get saved. Oh, great. These might be people who genuinely trusted Christ for salvation. But we have told them, or we, you know, theoretically we have told them, hey, everything will be great. And they actually, you know, a week later, a month later, whatever it is, they get persecuted because of being a Christian. They get mocked at work or at school. Uh, their, their finances are in trouble, their marriage is hurting, whatever it is. And they say, this Christianity stuff isn't really working. Uh, that's it. I'm done. And what they need are deeper roots. They need roots down into Christ. You know, kind of Colossians 2, 6 and 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith and so on. And so there are other ones. There's one in Acts uh, around 16, around, around 14 or 16, uh, Paul was going back around to the church and he, he stopped in and said to one of the disciples, the believers that were at this church, we must through many tribulations, we must through many persecutions, much, much, much trouble, we, we must go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Christian life is meant to be a life in which God allows and actually brings in difficulties in order, as you read, to, to drive us, to point us to our absolute need of God in our lives as the king, as the center of our lives. And so we want to do it. And that fits the title of the book, Coming to Know God. We want to know God deeply and uh, to, to know him in, in daily living. All right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? You're right. You're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Neither was I. Mm -hmm. Until I found Christ. Yep. And my days aren't rosy, but you know what? The Lord gets me through. Without Him, I am nothing. And you will mm -hmm. learn that once you receive Him. It's yeah. the Satan lies. The constant yes. yep. lies. And, mm -hmm. say, and not only to the believers, but the believers too. I mean, you know, lies that we all believe. Or we, we think of ourselves as women. Or whatever. Not or not. You know, and I just feel and it's really attacking mm -hmm. our youth right now. You know, that, that girl, the, um, Katie Metcalf, she is on my bus. Um, you know, she comes in with a smile on her face, yeah. telling me good morning, and everything else, and but yet inside she's tormented. Yeah. And, yep. you know, and she was one of my I want to kiss here. She does mm -hmm. know, you know, what the Lord can do for her. Yeah. But she is believing Satan's lies. Yep. yep. And it's an anxiety going to school. We've already lost another student. Oh, inside. wow. Yep. Um, this is two now, within... Um, just, it's just, it's awful. It is, yeah. And even our small, like, everything's on the glory, yep. you know, country house. Yep. Well, these kids are, are dying inside. Yes, they yep. Christ. They do, yeah, I feel yep. like we have nothing for them. Right. And it's awful. Yep. And it's right. the antidote is Christ. Yep. The answer is Christ. The answer is Christ. Yep. Yep. And that's what we have to get to. Yep. That's what we have to get to. Yep. Yep. Right. The, an the answer is found in knowing Christ. But again, the whole, the whole session here has been on not presenting as though it uh, is a panacea that fixes everything immediately. But that in Christ, we have the resources to face these things with grace, with joy, and so on. Yep. Anyone else? Even Christ himself, if we look at his example, yes. yep. he, he tells the disciples in two different um, places in John, John 14 and John 15, this is before he is arrested and is crucified. Yeah. He's trying to tell his disciples. He's not promising. They assume. They made some assumptions. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Yep. That there will be trials, there will be tribulation, mm -hmm. but I can give you my peace mm -hmm. through his blood, which they didn't understand mm -hmm. at the time. But, you know, Christ didn't promise roses either. He didn't promise no. he was going to no. overthrow the Roman government. He didn't, they were both of them. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he was trying to tell them, yes, in this world you will have tribulation. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Any, anyone else? 
All right, good discussion today. Uh, we will plan, Lord willing, to cover uh, chapter 22 next week. I think that wraps up the book. And appreciate the input today. Good thinking, good, uh, good discussion. So let's close in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you again for the time together with your people and for uh, this time of, uh, of instruction and, and uh, conversation about inward trials. We pray that you would give us grace to face each day uh, help us in our ministry of outreach to be clear with the gospel and also living it ourselves, that we would be an example to those around us. Bless uh, in the days ahead as, as the church uh, looks to you for direction. Bless our family as we wait on, uh, on your will for our lives as well. And in, in all of it, we'll give you the praise, the thanks, and all the glory. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.